My name is Warner Losh, and I have been the Nano BSD maintainer for about the past year. Today I'll be talking to you about using uh, Nano BSD to build embedded systems, and I'll be using FreeNAS um, as kind of an example of what you can do with Nano BSD and um, kind of walk through a couple other things it can do the <clears throat> as well. So I'll be giving a little bit of background and context. Um, I'll try not to read each bullet of the slide, though, um, and go into what NanoBSD does and doesn't do for you. Uh, talk a little bit about the differences of the NanoBSD uh, runtime environment. Uh, it uses a couple of different things uh, from a standard uh, desktop or server environment that are beneficial in the uh, embedded space. Um, once we get done talking about the basics of NanoBSD, I'll talk a little bit about FreeNAS, some of the things that it, uh, it can do, uh, what it is, uh, as well as some of the um, things we did with uh, NanoBSD to uh, build the product. And then at the end, if we still have enough time, I'll uh, walk through some of the um, FreeNAS uh, configuration files and scripts just to kind of show you how uh, you know, that complicated system is put together. What is NanoBSD? Uh, NanoBSD is a, a framework for creating FreeBSD images. Um, you can create these images for an embedded platform. Uh, some people are using NanoBSD to create jails or jail uh, images that they can clone. Other people are using it for similar things for VM. Um, uh, <coughs> I'll talk a little bit about those things as well as um, what are some of the goals that uh, NanoBSD um, tries to solve? What are some of the problems that it solves? And also, what are some of the problems it doesn't try to solve? Knowing um, some of the things that it doesn't solve will help you integrate it into your project a little bit more easily. And then we'll talk about FreeNAS. So NanoBSD is this big, giant shell script that Paul Henning wrote and that um, dozens of our users have hacked on. Um, we get about 10 or 20 patches a year from our developer community, so it's a fairly vibrant system. Um, the patch will build FreeBSD. Uh, it lets you control how you build FreeBSD. It will install FreeBSD into um, a staging area. It lets you control how to install FreeBSD, which might be different than how you built it. It also has um, orchestration to create a, a target image. So the most typical case that NanoBSD has been used for, it creates a bootable x86 uh, compact flash or USB stick image. Um, <clears throat> it also leverages FreeBSD's diskless environment uh, so that most things in the running system are read-only with a few things, read-write, and if you need to change the configuration, you need to jump through a few hoops. Uh, this is done primarily for safety. You don't want to change the configuration accidentally. Um, and I'll talk more about that as we get going. Um, so what's FreeNAS? You've heard me talk about it a couple of times. I'm wearing the t-shirt. FreeNAS is a FreeBSD-based NAS system. You can take a uh, off-the-shelf x86 box, put a bunch of disks into it, plug it into your network, install FreeNAS, and you have an instant server in a box. It's uh, built with NanoBSD. Um, it's got a web GUI for all the interaction that you do with it. Uh, the web GUI is Django-based if uh, you're a um, technology snob. Um, <coughs> Yeah, or a Python snob, yeah. Um, it uses kind of a model view controller, so the, the, the GUI uh, presents you a view of what the system will do. You make changes, and it uh, writes all the config files, updates a database. We segregate all the changes in FreeNAS onto a database, um, and then use that to generate all the config files. So talking a little bit more about NanoBSD, um, 
Well, what is NanoBSD? NanoBSD is a, a build system that you create a configuration file for. This configuration file contains a lot of metadata about your uh, system. The metadata uh, contains things like, I want my flash to be this big, uh, I want to build these parts, I want to install these parts, um, I need to, when the image is built, tweak the image in a particular way, um, I, um, and I want to, um, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's shell script, so you can do anything you can do in shell script with uh, nano BSD. Provides a nice generic framework for integrating into um, so that you can do what you need to do to build your system. <clears throat> and also, some of the metadata can include what architecture you, you want to run on. NanoBSD can be used to build cross-built platforms. Um, there are some limitations with the cross-building uh, that you uh, may have to work around. For native built platforms, it's, e it's fairly easy to hook ports into the system, build ports, create packages, and that kind of thing. For cross-built uh, platforms, you, can, you need to just build the packages beforehand, and then you can include them when everything gets installed. Um, NanoBSD has a lot of default behavior that uh, is helpful most of the time. Fortunately for those times that it's not so helpful, um, it's just a scroll ship and you can either set a shell variable to override the behavior or you can define your own function to override the behavior. <clears throat> so what are some of the things that you can, what's some of the stuff that you track uh, with NanoBSD? Um, what are some of the things that it does outside of just building FreeBSD? Well, one of the things it sets up is, that you set up with NanoBSD is how you are partitioning your uh, target media. The target media can be bootable, non-bootable. Um, in the case of embedded systems, um, maybe you're building just an image that has a, a kernel and a RAM disk. Um, it's, it's really fairly uh, generic um, what you can do with that. Um, so NanoBSD comes with a number of uh, standard scripts as well that get installed into the system. I'm not going to go through each one of these individually. The NanoBSD documentation goes into that. But these scripts help you manage your uh, installed NanoBSD system. So um, as I've been saying, um, Customization is done in NanoBSD via shell script. Uh, you define additional functions to call. You can register uh, functions to call at different customization points in the build process. Um, <clears throat> it lets you uh, uh, also set up the different sizes for the memory disks that NanoBSD uses that I'll be getting into in a second when I talk about the runtime environment. Uh, it also lets you set up additional partitions to mount. Uh, this can be useful if you are creating a read-write partition, if you're trying to uh, create uh, network mount points in your uh, appliance if it's a fairly specialized use, uh, and, and those kinds of things. Um, a number of things that I didn't list here that are, are customizations, um, you know, include permissions to set, um, tar files to include on the system, uh, other programs to build, and that kind of thing. So those are the sorts of things that NanoBSD can do for you. What are the sorts of things that aren't the target for NanoBSD. Well, the first thing is it's not a configuration management system. It's not a source code control system. The thing that it's building exists outside of NanoBSD. So if you want to pull in what you're building from uh, a single script, build it, and release, that kind of configuration management architecture is done external to NanoBSD. In fact, one of the examples, if we have time for it with FreeNAS, 
is uh, that we use a, a build system that creates a CV sub file, CV subs FreeBSD, patches it, builds it, uh, gets the image, and then uh, repackages the image onto a, a root only CD. Uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a build system, but it kind of isn't. It's, it's a system that does building, but it's not really a, a build system that you can hook a lot of things into easily. If you have a third party set of programs you want to build, that's problem, that can be problematical with NanoBSD. There are hooks in pertinent certain spots of the build system that you could hook into uh, that for simple cases work really well, but as you get more and more complicated or have uh, something you want to heavily optimize in your build system, they can start to become problematical. So what's NanoBSD used for? First of all, um, who here has build system using NanoBSD? <laughs> okay, um, so the reason that Paul Henning wrote it originally was for radar control boxes at Danish airports, um, so very embedded systems. So a lot of the examples that I could turn up are people using it to build embedded systems. Um, a lot of these embedded systems are um, vary from something fairly generic like FreeNAS or the BSD router project down to people uh, build NanoBSD systems for their little router that they have and they do that for the upgradability that NanoBSD gives you. Um, so embedded boxes and appliances are about the same thing uh, in a lot of, you know, can be viewed as the same way but, you know, when people think embedded boxes they think, you know, something that's the size of your phone or something that's the size of your router and when they think appliance they think you know something that might go in a rack that's one or two U high with maybe a bunch of other stuff with it. One of the interesting papers that was presented last year at EuroBSDCon was for, by a gentleman who uses NanoBSD to provision his jails. He has a whole set of scripts. When he needs a new jail he runs the script, uh, generates a reproducible jail that he can then deploy to one of his machines um, and crank up and go. Say what? Uh, okay. So um, people have also adapted this idea to different VMs where they just create a VM image that they then populate out. Um, same, you know, same idea. Um, and there's also uh, some people that are using this as part of their development process. They create standard NanoBSD images that they then boot and test their applications on um, as part of their continuous integration process. If somebody checks changes into the tree, um, a build cranks up and part of the build generates a NanoBSD image which is then copied to a simulator that, that, that runs the image to check for proper performance of the changes that were just checked in. Reports are generated and mailed out. Um, kind of an interesting, uh, though unconventional, use for NanoBSD when um, they approached me with some changes they wanted for it. <clears throat> so I've already listed two examples, FreeNAS and BSDRP. Um, for those that aren't familiar with BSDRP, it's um, Olivier, who originally did FreeNAS, decided that he didn't have time for FreeNAS anymore and his day job he had time to do BSDRP which is the uh, BSD based router plane. So it's a little router box that we were um, able to steal quite a bit of the configuration for when we went to the, uh, do the nano BSDized FreeNAS. So um, I know other people in the audience have done this for uh, wireless access points. What are some other uh, products that free or are, are there other products that people can think of that FreeNAS is used for? Hmm? I mean that NanoBSD is used for. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. I had forgotten PF since it switched. So um, in 9.0. 
we have a number of improvements that are coming into the tree for NanoBSD. One of the uh, pitfalls with the current NanoBSD um, in 8.x and earlier was that there was no support for a generic image. I want a one gigabyte image. Um, you couldn't say that easily in NanoBSD. It's a fairly basic concept. But NanoBSD grew up in the era of I have this basically compact flash. It emulates this IDE disk. It has this very, very specific geometry that if I don't get exactly right, the bootloader won't load the FreeBSD off of. So it um, has all of this complication built into it. So you would say, I want a SanDisk 512 megabyte disk for my, for my image. And well, actually, in, initially, I want a SanDisk 64 megabyte image disk for my image. And initially, when this was, when this was done, the um, flash didn't change all that often. Uh, vendors weren't completely, you know, were fairly consistent. You know, if you bought a particular card, it said SanDisk 64 meg, it would have the same geometry from lot to lot. It would have the, the same characteristics lot to lot. Um, then uh, flash manufacturers realized, hey, we're in the commodity business. People just want a card that has the label 64 on it. And if they buy our, our brand name, well, you know, so much better for us. We might be able to charge a little extra for it. So um, they transitioned from a model where, you know, it was a particular model that mapped all the way down to the chip to we're selling you a capacity. So this week, when you buy, go to, the, to Fry's and buy a, a lot, you might get one geometry. Next week, you might get another geometry. Um, fortunately, uh, and this was kind of a crazy situation, until FreeBSD grew support for the BIOS, for booting off the BIOS in packet mode. Once we did that, and all the old hardware that, only, that didn't understand packet mode went away, it made more sense to generate images that uh, were just images. It's this big, and that's all I care about. Put it on the disk, load it, run it, and so forth. And NanoBSD didn't keep up with that. You still had to specify an exact geometry, even though the bootloader was, was grabbing it with uh, the um, proper streaming uh, LBAs instead of the ge physical geometry. It's still, you know, NanoBSD still created this. So, in 9, you can have whatever size of image you want. Um, it's completely parameterized, so you don't have just a set number of three or four things to, fit, to pick from. If you want a 178,321 uh, megabyte image, we can do that. Um, there's better slash data support. And, and by that, I mean in previous versions of NanoBSD, uh, you could create the, the read-only image fairly easily, and it had a configuration image that uh, it would store data in after, uh, after you booted and ran and needed to change things. Um, but, you know, it didn't really have any way to, and you could have another data partition. It would, you know, create the FS tab entry and all that, but that was it. There was no way to pre-populate the data partition. There was no way to set different characteristics of that data po um, partition up easily. And so now you can populate the data partition, uh, set different attributes on the mount points, uh, and there's just a, a, a number of additional knobs that let you uh, deal with that more easily. FreeNAS needed this because, um, as I'll get to in a few minutes, FreeNAS uh, stores its database on slash data, and we ship with a pre-populated uh, database so that um, our GUI you know, works with some uh, defaults out of the box. Another thing that was a problem with FreeNAS, or NanoBSD, for a long time that we encountered when we were starting to deploy FreeNAS was we'd create an image, and it works great if you've got an ATA disk, but if you take the same uh, compact flash or um, an SD card in an adapter, but if you take that same image and put it on a thumb drive and try to boot, doesn't boot because there's no ATA disk. There's no um, AD0. And one of the things we enhanced NanoBSD with is we now label each of our UFS partitions and everything's done based on labels uh, so that 
when you come up, it doesn't matter if you're DA0, ADA0, um, you could install onto some funky RAID controller if you want. We don't care anymore. Um, and that was a fairly useful feature for our users of FreeNAS. So uh, that got merged back into NanoBSD. <clears throat> so some of the future imp uh, improvements with uh, FreeNAS that are on the horizon. One big piece that uh, or with, of NanoBSD that are on the horizon. Um, one big piece that uh, I didn't have time to get into NanoBSD before 9 was FreeNAS's uh, package port system. And briefly what that does is the first time you build, it will say, oh, I don't have a package for this. Go and check out the port. You know, do everything that ports do to build a package install that into the image, and cache a copy of the package. So the next time you go to build, it says, oh, I've got the package. I don't need to build GNOME again or whatever it took to build this package. Install it directly um, onto, the, uh, onto the image. And this saves a lot of time. A completely from scratch free NAS build without packages takes about three hours, and with packages it takes about five minutes. So it's a, it's a big time saver. It was a big time saver for us, and I just haven't had time to um, clean up the patches so that it's generic enough to be included in FreeBSD. I think I'm close, I, but that might make it into nine, but if it doesn't, it will be uh, something for the future. Um, about six months ago, somebody on the mailing list popped up and said, hey, I've looked at the NanoBSD shell script. I don't like its style. I think it sucks. Um, you know, you guys are crazy, why do you use this? And so I said, well, I kind of like the style and I don't think it sucks, but, um, you know, if, if you think that, rewrite it. And I thought, the usual, you know, this will shut the guy up, I'll never hear from him again, you know, these guys, people like to complain, you know, to make themselves look good, and about three months later he said, okay, here you go. <laughs> and he had rewritten NanoBSD in a completely, to my way of thinking, bizarre style of shell that he, that he liked. Um, so, I don't know. I'm kind of, <clears throat> I don't think I'll put that into FreeBSD, but somebody else might if, if, if this guy sticks around. I tried to send him mail before the conference to get, you know, permission to use his name and all this, even though some of this was in a public mailing list. And I didn't hear back from him in time, so we'll see uh, if that uh, happens um, or not. Because the last parting shot was, wow, this show looks a lot like Python. Maybe you should rewrite it in Python. <laughs> so maybe, we'll, maybe there'll be a uh, nanobsd.py that's a port because we can't put Python things into the base system. Um, so it's kind of a, an overview of nanobsd. Um, so when you're building a system with NanoBSD, um, you create a NanoBSD configuration file, you build with it, um, you boot it. One of the nice things about NanoBSD is that uh, you can configure it so that it uh, reserves one partition for upgrades. So when you install into one partition, um, run it for a while and you want to upgrade, you can install into the second partition, test boot it. If it works, great. You ping pong over to that. If it doesn't work, then you can go back to your original partition. Um, <clears throat> and this is just what the, the disk layout is. There's four partitions, two for the OS, one that stores configuration data after you boot. Um, since you're booting in a diskless environment, you have to store this uh, somewhere. Um, I'll talk about that in uh, in a minute, I probably should have put that slide earlier. Um, and then the fourth partition is optional. Uh, and a lot of people use it for read-write data right now. So this is the slide I should have been put earlier. Um, NetOBSD boots in a diskless environment. Uh, this is different than the normal uh, server environment or uh, laptop desktop environment that people are used to booting in. Um, in this environment, Slashes read only, users read only, 
pretty much everything is in one big slash partition. Um, <clears throat> slash etc is a um, RAM disk that is copied from uh, a set of files that are on the disk on boot, and then you play with it in memory. Uh, var is the same way. Um, I have mount on here for mount points. That's actually a free NAS only thing. That's something free NAS adds. It's one of the customization features that free NAS puts on top of FreeBSD uh, so that it can mount its mount points uh, without having to write to slash because slash is read only. If you want to create a new partition, you have to create a new directory. And we didn't want to mount slash read write, create the directory, and then unmount it. Um, this becomes a problem, particularly when you want to uh, have the right permissions and all this. It's easier just to create it, set it, and then start using it. Um, the S3 partition is slash CFG. Um, whenever you make a change to the system, if you change a password, if you create a new SSH key, um, do anything along those lines, uh, you have to run a command that mounts up the config partition copies the files that have changed to that, and then unmounts the partition. Um, this is done for safety because file systems that are unmounted in power failure generally don't get corrupted. Uh, so then when the system boots later, in addition to getting the files from the example place, it then mounts up this system and overwrites anything that you've overwritten. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a slash data for read-write data that, that gets used. So that's kind of the environment, <coughs> excuse me, that's the environment that, that NanoBSD operates in. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about FreeNAS. I'll, I'll give a, a little bit of a background for, for people that aren't familiar, uh, and then kind of walk through some of the features that um, it has. Um, I talked about these things earlier. The compelling features of FreeNAS is that it's um, ZFS in a box that handles all your network protocols uh, with a cool GUI front end. It's written in Django. The other thing that's really cool about FreeNAS is that on the GUI you can say, oh, I have an update kit, upload the image, enter a checksum so that uh, FreeNAS knows that the image you uploaded matches uh, to prevent uh, you know, people trying to spoof the image or truncated images, oh, it looks like it's the right size, and you find that you're missing the last half megabyte that has something important. Anyway, this checksum prevents all of that from happening. You hit upgrade, it reboots on the new partition, everything's cool. So, um, the way we accomplish this is we have, a, we have two custom scripts that we use, actually three, um, but well, two custom scripts that we use. One is the build script. This is what I talked about earlier. This is what creates the CV sub file, pulls down the right version of FreeBSD, either from a local mirror, remotely, um, applies, so we know exactly the sources we have. It applies a number of patches on top of that uh, that are needed for FreeNAS, fix a few bugs, maybe add a few features. Um, I think in FreeNAS 8.1, this will be used to add the ZFS 28 uh, patch set on top of uh, whatever stable FreeBSD is built, uh, assuming that the patch set is stable and all that good stuff. But it's looking good right now, so that'll probably be included in 8.1 through this feature. In 8, it just fixes a bunch of silly things. Um, I, don't, I think all the features that we added using it during the, the uh, development process actually made it into base FreeBSD, so we don't have anything huge. Once it applies the patches, um, it builds the system uh, with NanoBSD. This creates a bootable image, um, and this is where we ended this script because in our testing, we would take the bootable image and boot it right away, um, usually in VirtualBox or VMware or something like that. <coughs> Once we were happy with the image, we would create um, a live CD that packaged our installer and these images. The installer would um, basically DD the images into the disk that you select after doing a number of sanity checks on the disk. 
um, also offering, hey, this, this looks like it's some, one that's been installed already. Do you want me to preserve your data, uh, your configuration, and um, install the new image on top of that, and then do all the data migrations? Since the system is based on a database and uh, Django, uh, we use uh, data migrations. So version to version can roll forward and equally as important roll back if a new version is, um, is not a, doesn't work out for somebody for some reason. So, so these are the two uh, build scripts that we, that we use. In, it looks like uh, we will have time uh, to walk through some of these scripts a little bit later in this uh, presentation. So I've talked about the packages already for one of the things that FreeNAS layers on top. Um, we build a, a pure version of the database as part of the build process. So this gives us um, a database that has all the uh, schema and migration set up so when we want to layer on additional migrations in the future we can do that. Uh, since we've done a couple of releases it also has all the migrations we've done in the past to, to get to this point. Um, <clears throat> there's also support for cross-building FreeNAS. As um, the number of, six, of servers has grown um, in recent, uh, the number of 64-bit servers has grown in recent years and the number of 32-bit ones has shrunk. I don't have a 32-bit FreeBSD machine in my house that's capable of building FreeNAS. So when I needed to um, create a 32-bit image for the FreeNAS uploads or for a little 32-bit embedded box that I have for FreeNAS, I didn't know what to do. I tried a number of different things and, and, and discovered that you can build FreeNAS and all the ports um, for i386 on an AMD64 machine. Since that all worked, I added that support to uh, uh, initially to uh, FreeNAS's version of NanoBSD and eventually merged that back to FreeBSD. Um, <clears throat> if we didn't have to build packages because there's no cross support in ports, we could do the same thing for ARM. Um, I was able to build a, a FreeNAS uh, ARM image with uh, NanoBSD up until the point where we needed the packages. At that point, it died. Um, so, um, again, FreeNAS, FreeNAS's GUI is uh, based on Django. Um, uses Dojango to get uh, AJAX, Flight Pity, you know, fairly standard um, appliance GUI uh, setup. It's got a custom back end so that when you make changes, you don't have, it's not like a Windows situation where you have to reboot. You know, you add a file system, boom, it shows up. You add a network interface, it shows up. And all the file systems are exported on it that were exported on other network interfaces. Um, it's, it's fairly dynamic. The code also uses the same back end uh, logic, same back end scripts to add and remove things at runtime than it does at boot so that you have a fairly high degree of assurance that, um, well, I tested it out you know, live on the system. I don't have to separately test it on boot. When you're doing development, also, you know, it's a lot easier to develop things once than, than multiple times. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of screenshots of what the FreeNAS GUI looks like. This is the basic information uh, screenshot that you'll get to if you just connect to FreeNAS, um, gives a little bit of information about uh, what release we're based on, what the FreeNAS build is, you know, all this, you know, how long the system's been up, the load average. Um, different screens give you different uh, levels of monitoring. I'll, I'll show you one of those in a second. Um, you can configure different services with nice little click buttons. So if you want to turn uh, Apple Talk on, you just click on the, the, the Apple that you click on the on off switch, it turns on. You click on the little wrench if you want to edit the uh, setup for it. Um, we support a number of different, um, excuse me, we support a number of different uh, network services, LDAP, CFIS, FTP, NFS, iSCSI, you know, a few other more obscure ones. The 
framework is dynamic, so you could, in theory, extend it. Um, in FreeNAS 8.0, it's uh, <clears throat> a little bit awkward to do that directly. So that's not uh, something that I believe that uh, the community version is supporting right away. Right. So, um, you know, brave people can do it. Everybody else waits for 8.1 when uh, the, the, you know, you, a lot of the shortcomings of the current system will be addressed. Um, again, a screenshot from um, dealing with a disk, you know, and a screenshot for dealing with monitoring. It's CPU usage. The, this was a little bit too wide for my slide, but it um, uh, you know, shows network performance and a number of other things um, on different time scales. So one of the most interesting aspects, um, or maybe one of the most more controversial aspects in FreeNAS is that we went in seven and er uh, FreeNAS seven and earlier, the, everything was stored in an XML database, except for the things that weren't, that were in etcrc or in some other configuration file or stored somewhere else. And this presented problems on upgrade. People would lose some information sometimes, uh, the upgrade scripts were more complicated than they needed to be. Um, so in, in FreeNAS 8, we moved everything into a MySQL database that lives on the data partition. We then generate every single file in the system from this uh, into the memory file system, uh, Etsy. <coughs> um, this is great. Or it's, it's SQLite, although it's, it's oh, it's, extracted. So, so it's, it's SQLite? Yeah, it's SQLite. It could be on. Okay, sorry. I forgot. I knew I wasn't uh, Postgres, so I picked the wrong wrong one that wasn't Postgres. So it's a SQLite database, so that it's uh, less impact or cooler or something. You know, this is uh, great for novices. They don't have to to learn anything. If they want to migrate uh, their system to a new system, it's to grab the database file and go. Um, but for experts that want to tweak it, um, we've had some. There has been some feedback that. Uh, it's not as tweakable as they'd like. So, um, anyway, I've, I've talked about the back end a little bit earlier, and this goes into a little bit more detail. Um, there are two things that the back end does. One is convert the, the database uh, tables to FreeBSD configuration files. And then the second one is uh, to in those cases where just creating the data file isn't enough to configure the system, um, it bolts together the, the, the system in, in, in various ways. Um, these are done in Python using triggers, so when you do something in the GUI, the trigger fires and everything um, happens properly behind the scenes. Um, <clears throat> it works out fairly well and gives a nice feel to the system. Uh, we have a very limited console GUI as well that hooks into this, primarily used for setting the IP address of the system. I've, I've put these files uh, up so they don't get lost in the fullness of time. And if you want to check out FreeNAS and build it or, or look at the, the build your own system based on it, I put the uh, SourceForge uh, repository for the free version of FreeNAS. Um, so we have a little bit of time. I'm going to do a brief walkthrough of uh, um, the config files and the, the build script. This is a NanoBSD configuration file for FreeNAS. NanoBSD configuration files are based on the BSD RP router project ones I have pulled in from Sam's um, AV, uh, Viola stuff. So this is the main uh, configuration file for uh, FreeNAS. Um, you set a lot of variables. Uh, we needed to upgrade to Python 2.7, and there were two things we needed to do to make that happen with big, nasty comments. Um, and the usual way that you create and customize your system is uh, you create a number of functions, and you add them to the uh, what's called customize command. We'll Add that function to be to the list of things that get called when 
um, the system's being customized. There's a similar one for customized late command uh, for after everything's built. Um, and I don't think I need to walk through each one of these. These are just different things that FreeNAS needed to do um, to get the, the files onto the system. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things you need to do if you want to build a reduced system is have a big long list of uh, without ACPI, without you know, Bluetooth, et cetera, to limit the number of things that are built for the system. And um, that worked out okay for FreeNAS, mostly because I was able to st steal Sam's Avila list and add the new withouts that had um, been added to the system before then and take out the parts of it that he omitted but FreeNAS actually needed. Um, we build and install differently with FreeNAS. Um, <clears throat> we build with all of these things, but when we're installing, we also uh, install no debug. Uh, no port, no man pages, et cetera. Um, and um, there's another little bit of uh, package only make conf. Um, one of the things since we're building uh, ports, we do that basically in the free NAS uh, root environment in a, as a chroot so that we don't um, uh, contaminate the host build. The, the host system with our builds, and the host system doesn't contaminate us with, with our stuff. Uh, but to do that, we have to install the tool chains and compilers and all that. So the first time we build everything, we build a really fat image that has compilers and uh, everything we need to build ports. And then when we have all the packages built, we can optimize those out and have a much smaller system. Um, and I'll, I'll talk. I'll, that'll, I'll show that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> the way that we determine whether or not a package exists is uh, there's a, a separate file where we list all the ports, um, and I'll show that in a second. But if the port is, has a package available, we um, add a customized hook that runs this function. Um, and if it's uh, a port, we have a customized hook that does all this. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but the, the, the short answer is we set up an environment that ports will like, we cheroot to it, we build them, we extract the package out when we're done. And then we unwind all the way out um, in case something went wrong. Or if nothing goes wrong, we clean up and make sure everything is cool. That's what all that is. Um, and then add port is what dis distinguishes between the two. We actually have a, a second a uh, file that um, adds all our ports, um, which is this guy. Um, it primarily just adds all the ports in a big long list of, of ports. One of the disadvantages of this, one of the main reasons I haven't pushed it back into FreeBSD, you have to add the ports in, de in uh, depth first dependency order. Otherwise the packages won't be get built and pulled out of, the, uh, out of the tree correctly. I don't know if this is okay, if people would want the reduced functionality with this limitation or if they want me to solve that problem before they're comfortable with this in the tree. So that's, that, that's why this doesn't look like, this looks like a mostly but not completely ordered list. Um, so yeah, this is the code to do that. Um, and then every uh, project I've worked on has a catch-all, you know, custom function at the end that does whatever it can. It's like, well, we don't need uh, we, uh, an uncompressed kernel, so we compress the kernel and save a certain amount, and so on for all these other things. I'm not going to read through them individually. It's out there if you want to look at it. Um, and then uh, at the end, anything that went, we unmount a bunch of stuff. Um, this actually happens first, even though it's at the end of this file. We unmount a bunch of stuff if you um, tried to do a build and it failed and left things hanging out. Um, so, you know, this is the big long list of ports. Um, I don't think I need to go through it other than just to, you know, show you that, for example, with uh, um, our monitoring software, we needed to build the port without X11 to, pre to prevent um, X11 from getting contaminated or contaminating the build and bloating things excessively. Um, 
because the, the monitoring software could pop up an X window or create PNG graphs. And um, since we were never going to pop up an X window, it was kind of silly to have X. Um, <clears throat> uh, in there, you know, some of these have, you know, try to build without Perl, although um, we wound up having to install Perl and then deleting it because Git text uses it, which boggles my mind. But, you know, there we go. And then there's a couple of other things to build our database. I don't know why, uh, oh, <clears throat> uh, it, I put things in one file versus the other, but so all that stuff's here. Um, <clears throat> and then this is a little bit of the uh, build orchestration where we um, export the architecture that we're going to build. Um, we default to the current architecture. Um, and put everything in obj dot that architecture. This just lets us build multiple architectures at the same time. Uh, AMD 64 and i386 were the two that uh, we built. I was hoping uh, to get this to the point of building ARM and MIPS, but I didn't have the time to do that. This script uh, creates a CV subfile, applies all our patches um, for ports, for source, um, yeah, you must be root to run this. Um, it checks uh, that we've got uh, some arguments set up right, um, and then invokes nano BSD and compresses uh, our disk image and checksums it. So it's a fairly simple, simple script, but it shows that. If you're using NanoBSD, you need to create one layer out because NanoBSD doesn't manage the, what, what's building. It just builds what it's told to build. So um, are there any other questions? That yes, Sam? What's the minimum size of an image The minimum size of an image I was able to generate was 32 meg. The minimum size for free NAS is or the size for free NAS is closer to 300 meg, um, just because of uh, all the all the stuff that we put in and all the packages we include. But um, I was able to create a 32 meg image. It's really tight, not much, nothing fancy on it, um, and it took a lot of uh, tweaking and going, you know, looking at the files and the customized scripts were uh, quite a bit longer because it deleted quite a bit more. 64 is really easy to do. 32, you can, 48, you can do with a little bit of pain. 32, with a lot of pain, much smaller than that. And uh, you probably should use a different technology to generate your image. But, but free NAS is free. <laughs> <laughs> the normal build for free NAS is 460 meg. The um, debug build is quite a bit larger than that. So it creates a one gigabyte image our one gigabyte partition to put all the, 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 the extra debug stuff into. So, um, so this script needs that to be done as root. One of the things that's noticeable about the script is you have to run it as root. And if, even if you didn't notice that this script needed to be run, it as, run as root, you know the build world and install world, which are part of nanode BSD, need to be run as root. Um, there's a lot of interest for running it as an unprivileged user. Uh, people don't like to make big build machines and then give root to everybody. That's not a good mental model that admins can wrap their head around. <clears throat> One of the nice things that NetBSD has done is they've, um, they've gone and uh, made some changes to install to uh, copy the file. And instead of setting all the metadata on the file, um, it records it to an mtree file. So that everything gets installed, you have the mtree file, you can then take the installed tree and a copy of the mtree file to create the image uh, with makefs. So that's certainly a well-trodden -trod path. That's a path I'd like to see FreeBSD do. Um, NetBSD's patches don't just drop in. Um, they require a little bit of work to get right, but if somebody had a couple of weeks or we could get a summer of code student to do this, uh, even, um, you know, we, we could potentially go to an unprivileged install. Um, you know, there's, it's, 
a lot of grunt work, a lot of stupid details, uh, but it's certainly doable. NetBSD does it today. I don't see any technical reason in our build why we couldn't do it. Once we have that, then NanoBSD doesn't need to run as root anymore. Um, you know, it could go over from, right now it builds into uh, an MD image. Um, it could easily, just as easily use MakeFS to make that image. You, you build everything into your staging area and then you MakeFS that tree into your target. That stuff was in FreeNAS 7 and earlier, and um, to get things out, that was um, taken out. We didn't have the expertise to write a really good uh, GUI interface for it and to do it justice. And rather than have it be in there but kind of broken or icky, we said, ah, we'll leave it out and put that in in the next revision. So, Brooks. I know of one person who managed to get package add to work with a beta version of FreeNAS, and his recipe was a wiki that was like 15 screens long. So I think your analysis is right, um, and you know that is too difficult, and that's why in 8.1 packages will be um, one of the main features in 8.1. Union mount over root. If you have to do it today, you can package add everything, and then copy the files back onto the flash and you know that was part of the 15 page wiki that um, you know described each of the things you had to do in minute detail and also how to do union mounts if it, the, the, the root file system is really sized for what nano BSD or FreeNAS needs right now and just a little bit more you know because I had, don't want to bump the size again before we release you know so um, and to summarize since I'm taping this Josh said that uh, PBIs with uh, union mount would be the solution that's in 8.1. Um, that gives you uh, the storage, that gives you the integration into the GUI, um, and that lets you add and remove things after rebooting and all this good stuff. And all that, all that metadata will be preserved and made nice and easy for the user to use. So I guess that's it. Thank you.